A paradigm shift is a radical change which can happen in the practices of any field or institution. The University World News reviews the paradigm shift as a concept mainly from the work of the philosopher Thomas Kuhn, who was considered the man who changed the way the world looked at science. Today, we do hope that this short lecture will make you change the way you look at education. Welcome to the sixth online lecture series of Far Eastern University Institute of Education graduate programs in transnational education. To officially begin, we shall have the opening remarks and the introduction of the speaker. I'd like to give you the Dean of the College, Dr. John Harold Polala. Good afternoon, Dean. Good afternoon, everyone. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. We are grateful having our attendees from other universities here and abroad. As we have today, our sixth online lecture series which features special topics and education. In advance, I would like to thank our speaker in this lecture series for supporting us in our commitment to deliver accessible, quality, and research-based education. You know, as a Center of Excellence in Teacher Education, awarded by our Commission on Higher Education, we uphold the value of educational research and we commit to strengthening teacher education as a discipline in our country. This is also why, after a round of faculty training for wire, Wired Flexible Learning in support of CHED by Anihan Project, we are continuing this special lecture about a timely topic in education through our featured speaker in the department. Our speaker was a dear, uh, dear friend of us who is a com competent faculty in the graduate programs, is fully committed to providing excellent learning experience, whether face-to-face -face or online among masters and doctoral students. Hopefully, today's special topic will make our students in the program, including you, our attendees of this lecture, reflect on how we can best deliver education, especially in this time of pandemic. We hope as well that through this lecture, you can assess where you are in the educational shift. To meet these objectives, let me give you more information about our speaker. She holds the Doctor of Education, major in Literature and Language Education. She specializes in the following contents, pedagogy, second language learning, trends and issues in literature and language education. Recently, she was invited by Adamas University School of Education in Calcutta, India, to share on how FEU had made a paradigm shift. And today, she would share on how such shift can be adopted in one's own context. I am uh, personally excited to hear the presentation of Dr. Arlos. I'm sure you will learn a lot from this uh, lecture today. Attendees, it is with great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker. She is currently the director of our Academic Quality Assurance. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Isa P. Arlos. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Dean Harold. Good afternoon, attendees. So this afternoon's short lecture series is going to focus on the paradigm shift in education from teaching to learning. This talk is going to re uh, revolve on the drivers of the paradigm shift, the role of the teacher in the educational shift, the instructional paradigm versus the learning paradigm as taken from Bard and Tag, and the requirements of the paradigm shift. The paradigm shift in education is best described in the words of Albert Einstein, which implies that for education to produce different results, then we need to change our perspectives on how we perceive teaching and learning. At present, many students still sit in our classrooms 
bombarded with lectures and assessments which require to memorize, which require students to memorize terminologies and regurgitate memorized information. This scenario shows an apparent gap in our education system. Our classroom activities seem disconnected or unparalleled to the world outside the four walls of the classroom. For education to serve its purpose, which is to benefit the society and contribute to the growth, it has to encourage seeking for truth and enlightenment. Rabindranath Tagore's educational philosophy reflects this view of education, where education breaks the boundaries of culture, race, religion, and social status. This way, education will bank on the development of every individual or student's thinking and creativity. This also places the emphasis on the balance between academics and co-curricular activities that students engage in, a holistic development. However, studies and researches will show that the gap has not been addressed. The following researches on the mismatch of education system and the skills required in the global arena are the following. Nashas in 2015 um, conducted the study and the, ex and the study showed that the extent of skills mismatch among childhood education graduates of Princess Alia University College found that actually the university graduates were not adequately prepared for work with respect to the skills demanded in the labor market. The major mismatch were found in communication, interpersonal, decision making, critical thinking, and analytical skills, with analytical skill as the most required in the world market. In another th study in 2007 by Mavromas and McGinnis, in the editor's introduction published in the Australian Economic Review, it revealed that the education and skills mismatch has a direct effect on the wages of employees. In the Philippines, Pajares et al. in 2013 conducted a study on the sectoral and skills mismatch between senior high school program and top in-demand jobs and projected in-demand jobs in the province of Cebu. It revealed that a mismatch, particularly skills gap or skills deficit exists because the skills being emphasized in the senior high school program is not paralleled to the demand of the labor market. Hence, paradigm shift in education is much needed to address the gap. Now, what is the paradigm shift that we are referring to here? We are looking into a shift on what teachers share how they share it, and how students receive it. We also need to revisit and reflect on the values that we teach our students, as well as the skills that they need to acquire in order for them to become lifelong learners or acquire the skill of learning for life, the ability to be self-efficient. What led to the paradigm shift in education? First, the globalization, internationalization of education, the changes in the socioeconomic landscape, the global political, legal, educational reforms, and the technological innovations. These drivers led to first, the emergence of universal access or right-based approach to education or the democratization of knowledge, which means that the acquisition and spread of knowledge is becoming accessible to everyone, not just a privileged few. Lifelong learning is now a human right. Second, the emergence of a more effective forms of teaching and learning with the advent of new strategies and techniques that focus on skills rather than memorization of concepts. Now, what is the role of the teachers in this paradigm shift in education? Where are we, the educators or the teachers in this shift? As frontliners for this paradigm shift, we play a very crucial role in ensuring its success. The 21st century education drives the, le the learner to actually utilize technology-based learning. 
It's about developing in the students the skills that they need and help them develop the confidence in using these skills to succeed in the new world, in the 21st century world. With so much information available to our students, with just the click of the mouse, the teachers, our job is to focus more on making sense of the information, sharing it, and using it in an intelligent, responsible, and productive way. The change in our role as teachers proves the paradigm shift. In the new paradigm, teachers facilitate or guide students to learn. Transfer of information is no longer linear. Dialogues and display of creativity are encouraged. Thus, the teacher's focus is on competency rather than on content. Students are trained to think critically, solve simple and complex problems, collaborate in various tasks, display creativity, and adapt in various situations. With this premise in mind, the teacher in the paradigm, in the new learning paradigm, or in the learning paradigm, is a designer of learning. The teacher who designs the flow of the class from the activation of the prior knowledge to assessment. Designing also involves creating conducive environment for learning and creating activities that will cater to the needs and interest of the students. Second, the teacher should be a facilitator of learning. No longer the sage on the stage, rather a guide on the side. Again, a facilitator of learning who is not the sage on the stage, rather a guide on the side. A facilitator of learning scaffolds students' tasks, ask questions to prompt discussions, assist students in using new information and materials by connecting it to their prior knowledge. And finally, an assessor of learning. Someone who designs and carefully selects appropriate assessment tools to check students' progress and development of target competencies. An effective assessor of learning is also able to provide feedback for students as a basis for further development or growth. However, the challenge for us teachers is that are we equipped with trainings and sufficient resources to facilitate teaching and learning in the 21st century classroom? Are teachers equipped with trainings and sufficient resources to facilitate a student-centered classroom? There are various factors that are actually radically transform transforming teaching and learning landscape. As agents of change in education, there is a need to see that the shift in the teaching and learning paradigm is not only necessary as we move to respond to the complex global demand for high quality, meaningful in skills-based learning education in this ever-changing social, cultural, and technological environments we are in, from providing instruction to producing learning. The challenges to address these demands are enormous, for it requires that we revisit and we reflect on our teacher-centered instruction rooted in our traditions, which revolve on prescriptive knowledge and transmission of content using low-order levels of knowledge or intellectual engagement. We call this traditional dominant paradigm the instructional paradigm or IP that banks on 50-minute lectures paired with recitations and traditional paper and pencil tests, which requires students to regurgitate large amount of content without being mindful of application or skills acquisition. Thankfully, we are now shifting to the new paradigm. We are now shifting our mindset. So from providing instruction, we now see education or the teaching and learning as a means to produce learning, the learning paradigm. In this paradigm, both the teachers and the students are liberated from oppressing constraints brought about by the instructional paradigm. 
lectures that are no longer or no longer optimize students' learning are not the only means to achieve the ends. And students are now taught using carefully and intelligently selected methods, approaches, and techniques that will best address students' needs and interests. Now, let's look at the two paradigms. Let's compare the two paradigms using Barr and Tag's article from Teaching to Learning, a new paradigm for undergraduate education. In the article, Barr and Tag actually compared instructional paradigm versus learning paradigm in various aspects. And I had to pick out uh, some important highlights of the paper. First, for Barr and Tag, he sees education that is a um, aligned to IP as something that's automatic or automistic. In IP, the word autumn actually refers to the 50 minute lecture and the molecule is the one teacher, one classroom, three credit hour course. Um, in the instructional paradigm, learning is actually very rigid. The teaching and learning process is governed by the rule, by, by the rule of time that the learning should be held constant despite the fact that learning for each of our students actually varies. Our schools are captives of clock and calendar despite the reality that students learn in various paces and in different ways. We define our students learning time by, by time and schedule instead of learning outcomes. As we shift from automistic, we now look into the learning paradigm. We now look at learning as something that is holistic. From the view of the learning paradigm, there is no one answer to the question of how to organize learning environments and experiences. It supports any learning method and structure that works, which is actually defined by the learning outcomes that we, uh, we need to achieve towards the end of the year or towards the end of the semester. The LP or the learning paradigm subscribes a constant search for new structures, new methods that work better to improve student learning and success and expects even these to be redesigned continually and to evolve over time. So I'm going to show to you the differences between the instructional paradigm and the learning paradigm and how it can be uh, applied in class. For automatic to holistic, from time held constant to learning held constant, I, we can use project-based activities. Later on, I'm going to show you how specifically you can apply this in your classes. From being teacher-centered, we now shift to student-centered, and we can use the constructivist approach. From transfer of knowledge from teacher to students, we are now shifting to eliciting student discovery and construction, uh, construction of knowledge. From teachers have one size fits all mentality and approach, we now shift to teachers develop every student's competencies and talent. And we can use here competency based learning. How are we going to apply this in the classroom? For project based, we can use investigations in mathematics and science, so we can have um, like, for example, you can ask your students to investigate the causes of a viral disease. For you can also ask them to do an experiment to show how materials undergo changes. So you can have science investigatory projects. For constructivist teaching and learning, you can ask your students to do journal writing, reflexivity paper, integrative paper. So you can have written outputs on events, and students' personal learnings, their stand on social issues. You can also have a variety of oral presentation activities like vlogging, podcasts, TED Talks, and Pecha Kucha. For competency-based learning, we can have simulations such as simulate hotel check-in and check-out. You can have micro-teaching, banking transactions, and so on. So in this shift, what do we give premium to? 
first, we need to make education more about our students, not the lessons nor the teachers. Second, we need to change or update how we design our lessons. And finally, we need to change or update how we design our assessments, how we use assessments. We need to think that if we create assessments, assessments should reflect how we teach and vice versa. So our aim should be to make students lifelong learners who are responsible global citizens sensitive to the plight of their communities and work towards the advancement of the society. The lesson design should mirror what is happening in the world. Activities and topics should evoke critical thinking, empathy, and spiritual growth. Our classes should be free from any form of discrimination. Students should be free to encourage or students should be encouraged to express themselves in a very responsible manner and foster individuality. And finally, our assessments should focus on the skills that the global market demands. There should be a match between what is learned and assessed in our class to the requirements in the various industries globally. The shift to this new paradigm is a bumpy ride, which is actually, I can say, probably the same for Far Eastern University when it transitioned to the new paradigm. Now, how do we meet the challenge? Let us evaluate if we have the following or if we are actually doing the following in our classes, in our institutions, in our programs. First, do we conduct in-depth and extensive teacher training? Do we conduct in-depth and extensive orientation program for all our students? Do we provide resource materials that both our students and teachers can access? Do we restructure or did we restructure our learning environments to cater to skills-based courses, blended learning classes, and professional courses? And finally, did we update or revamp our curriculum. So may I ask, where are we in this shift? And I address this to everyone, including us, educators in FEU. First, when we think of, our sh of the paradigm shift, to be honest, we are still, or we still have a long journey. We are far from Finland or Singapore's thinking schools, but all the more that we need to work harder to reach that. At this point, what we need to focus on our first, we need to revisit our educational system. What do we give premium to in our educational system? In the discussion yesterday, in the ASEAN qualifications and quality assurance, they are now shifting into focusing more on the learning outcomes. That our measurement for education should not be on the amount of content, rather on the learning outcomes that we want to target towards the end of the school year or towards the end of the program. Second, to evaluate the existing educational policies that we have. It wouldn't hurt to look at what we have, what we don't have, and what we need to work on. Third, we need to look into how we can train our teachers to develop expertise in the student-centered paradigm. Also, we need to revisit and evaluate the use of student assessments. We need to look at how we make use of our formative and summative assessments. And finally, we need to strengthen the relationship between educational institutions and the business sector or the various industries. What we do in schools, in universities should reflect what our business sector, our industries need. The road to success is still bumpy. We're still far from reaching our goal. But uh, though the ride is not easy, we need to always think of the future of our society, our students. So with that in thought, let us not rest our laurels and keep on going and keep on striving in achieving that goal to create 
a student-centered classroom for each of the Filipino learners. Uh, this ends my presentation. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much, Dr. Isa. Truly, um, at this time, our focus in education is to ensure that we are delivering quality education and we are putting our students at the center. We are now moving to the question and answer. And uh, let me read one of the questions in our, um, on our list here. Uh, Dr. Isa, can you give us tips uh, for those taking up teacher education programs? So how do we ensure mastery of the subject matter since there had been a change or shift in approach? So I, I just uh, did a, a little rewording on that. It was a question from one of our audiences. Um, specific uh, applications? Or so, um, well, how do we ensure mastery of the subject matter since iba na yung approach or we are now using a different approach? All right. Um, first, if you are using a different approach, uh, look, go back first to the learning outcomes that you are actually targeting. To ensure mastery, we as teachers need to first understand what is our learning outcomes, what's our target, and then uh, work from that. Create um, activities that will strengthen or that supports that is aligned to the learning outcomes that you are actually targeting. Align that to the assessments that you are creating. It's not because that we are shifting to the new paradigm. We can no longer um, assure the mastery of learning. Rather, we are actually shifting to focus more on the essential of learning, which is the mastery of the skill. Um, and not the mastery of content because there's really it, it doesn't mean that if you master content um, you're sacrificing uh, or it doesn't uh, mean that with the shift you are actually sacrificing something it's actually the other way around you're using the shift for you to ensure that students are able to master the learning outcomes, the skills or the competencies that they need to, to master. It's really more of redesigning, redesigning how you're going to conduct your classes, redesigning your activities. Again, there is actually a, um, a wrong notion that, that with the shift of the um, from IP to LP, you are no longer going to have um, a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation. In an LP classroom, you can have actually a combination of, of all. However, the difference is that the, um, there is a shift of, of power from being uh, the powerful teacher. You are actually shifting the power and delegating it to everyone in class, which makes also the learning a responsibility of everyone in the classroom, not only that of the teacher, so learning will not only depend on on how much information the teachers share, rather it's it's a communal um, obligation or responsibility. Thank you, Dr. Aisa, and thank you to our attendee who raised that question. Uh, we can also we have here another question. Maybe this is uh, we can consider this as our last question for our other attendees. I'm sure Dr. Aisa will gladly accommodate your questions through our Q and A. Yeah, and we can probably also encourage her to engage with our um, Facebook. So um, you okay? Here's a question. So earlier, Dr. Aisa, you mentioned that there or it was mentioned that there was a shift also in 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 the context of your school FEU. Yeah. How easy or how difficult was the paradigm shift in the context or, or experience of your school? Actually, I think the right person who can really narrate the experience is Sir Harold because they, they are the pioneers of the shift in, in FEU. Um, I'm like the receiver towards the end. It's because when I came, there was already an established um, mechanism, mechanism on how they work on this. But the way I understand it, I think part of the shift is that retraining faculty members. Uh, retraining involves everybody. The the seasoned one and the new teachers. So in FAU, what we do actually is that when you begin or when you get hired, you get trained for seven months and uh, we undergo before we call it DELEC, now we call it uh, CTS. That's one way of ensuring that teachers are well trained with the new paradigm. And then at the start of the term, 
the students actually have an extensive orientations. We have Tatak Tamara, we have classroom orientations because we need to inform and ensure that the students are on board with the new paradigm that we have. And um, one requirement of the paradigm is for our students to actually to actually read and participate in classes. Um, another thing uh, I think that FU did was they had to restructure some of the classrooms. We now have classrooms that no longer have armchairs, and these are small classrooms composed of 20 to 25 maximum chairs because these are intended for classes wherein students are encouraged to to uh, discuss and work collaboratively with each other. So that one. And then um, last, no, no, this year, last year and this year, we worked on um, revising our curriculum. We did a curriculum mapping and we had to um, work on the learning outcomes and um, uh, we need to revisit the learning outcomes that we had uh, for each department and for each course. And this one I can I can proudly say because we are actually working on it with Sir Harold and other directors from other units. We mapped out our learning outcomes from the FAU vision and mission to the graduate attributes that we have down to the course expected learning outcomes to ensure that there is alignment of learning and FEU and that we are aligned with the learning paradigm or the student-centered learning. Thank you very much, Dr. Isa, and thank you for giving us uh, time to reflect on where we are now in this big or drastic shift in education. And um, to our attendees, uh, if you would like to hear more or know more about Dr. Isa, maybe we should encourage you also to to attend her classes, perhaps <laughs> enroll, enroll to our programs in the department. So you would have the chance to get to know more about education and of course language and literature through our speaker, Dr. Isa. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Isa. You. Thank you. Okay, and we thank our attendees here in Microsoft Teams and our viewers in Facebook Live. Um, at this juncture, I would like to encourage our attendees to click the link that is provided in the Q&A so that you can evaluate this program. Also, I would like to announce that there will be the first international conference on multi perspectives in education to be facilitated by the three big departments or offices of Far Eastern University. The, the link can also be accessed through our uh, social media, and it is happening in November. The call for papers is already on. And now um, I'd like to, again, um, encourage everybody to stay posted so that you would know the next schedule of our online our free online lecture series, and so that you would have updates as regards our first international conference happening in November. I am Chini, and it had been a pleasure being your moderator for this lecture. God bless you, everyone. Mabuhay. <laughs>